they can normally see us. Now I say normally because there are some exceptions. There are some times when people do see the jinn. There are some times when some people who are possessed see the jinn or when the jinn take the form of animals or the jinn take the form of human beings. But in general, we can't see them and they can see us. That's the general rule. And the evidence for this is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-A'raf. Indeed, him and his tribe see you from where you do not see them. He and his tribe see you from where you do not see them. There are three kinds of jinn that the Prophet ﷺ told us about. He said there are three types of jinn. One flies through the air. Another type consists of snakes and dogs. A third type is based in one place but travels about. Now the reason I mention this particular hadith right here is for a very important reason. Notice how the Prophet ﷺ mentions the jinn in different categories. Or he mentions different types of jinn. Now whether these three are the only three, or whether they are a part of a larger group of three, whether this is an example of the most common three, or three that the Prophet ﷺ was drawing attention to, it doesn't matter. But what does matter is that the jinn are of different types. And one big mistake that people make when dealing with the jinn is that they deal with the jinn as though they are all the same. They deal with the jinn as though every single jinni is exactly like every other jinni. They're all the same. Whereas in fact they're very, very different from each other. The Prophet said describes one that flies through the air, i.e. it lives in the sky. It doesn't, it doesn't inhabit the earth. It lives in the sky and it flies through the air from place to place. Another type of jinn the Prophet mentioned is a jinn that takes the form of snakes and dogs. That doesn't mean that every snake is a jinn. Or that every dog is a jinn, and I think that's quite obvious, but we should mention that in just to, or for emphasis. But it means that there are certain types or certain examples where the jinn or certain kinds of jinn who appear to us in the form of snakes and dogs. And the third one is very similar to human beings in the sense that they're based in one place, they have a home, they have a residence, and they travel around from area to area. So this is another type of jinn. There are other kinds of jinn that are mentioned in the Quran. One of the kinds of jinn that are mentioned in the Quran are diving jinn that live in the, or that dive into the depths of the sea. Are they the same jinn that are mentioned here? Allah knows best. It's very important that we limit ourselves to the text of the Quran and the Sunnah when we're talking about the unseen. That we don't try to you know, speak from our own opinion or we don't try to sort of hypothesize we don't try to sort of make up ideas or, you know, this is what someone thinks and this is what the other person thinks. We try to limit it to what we see in the Quran and the Sunnah. So I don't know whether the diving jinn are the same jinn that are mentioned here or whether the diving jinn are a fourth category of jinn that live in the sea. But the main thing that we know is that we know that the jinn are of different types and they have different kinds of characteristics and different natures and different abilities. Another critical point which is a major mistake a lot of Muslims make when it comes to the jinn, is that they consider all of the jinn to be evil. Not all of the jinn are evil. The word jinn is not synonymous with shaitan, nor is the word shaitan synonymous with the word jinn. The jinn and the shaitan are two completely different things. There is a similarity or there is a, a, a crossover, but the, the jinn and the shaitan are not the same thing. So as for the jinn, the jinn are this creation and they're not inherently evil. There are Muslim jinn, Christian jinn, Buddhist jinn, and this is mentioned in the Quran. And others are those who have submitted to Allah, those who are Muslims, and others are those who are al-qasitun, those who are uh, deviant or those who are not Muslim. So Allah mentions that from the jinn there are those who are Muslim and from the jinn there are those who are not Muslim. From the non-Muslims amongst the jinn, there are those who are sympathetic towards Islam, just like you have Muslim non-Muslims in this country who are sympathetic towards Islam. From them are those who are very, very opposed to Islam. From them are those who have made it their life's work to attack Islam. From it are those who are open to accepting Islam. So do not think of the jinn as being inherently evil. Think of the jinn as being just like human beings. Many different types, many different tribes, many different, if you like, races or nationalities, 
many different religious backgrounds. The jinn are of many different types. They are not all the same. The shaitan, on the other hand, is a devil. What is the shaitan? The shaitan, or the word shaitan in Arabic, refers to someone who goes beyond all limits. You know, you get people who sin. All of us sin, right? The Prophet said, All of the children of Adam sin, and the best ones who sin are those who repent. So we know all of us sin. But there's a difference between someone who sins and someone who makes sin their life's work and their life's objective. And there's a difference between someone who sins and someone who dedicates their life to evil. There's a difference between the two things. Someone who dedicates their life to evil, whether they are human or whether they are a jinn, those people, we refer to them as being shaitan. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran, shayateen al-insi wal-jinn. Shayateen al-ins wal-jinn. Shaitan from the men and shaitan from the jinn. And Allah says, and like this we have made for every prophet an enemy, Shaitan from the men and the jinn. So this tells us that the word shaitan refers to any human being or any jinn who is inherently evil and who has dedicated themselves to going beyond the limits of Allah and to trying to destroy the truth and trying to conceal the truth and take people away from the path of Allah. This is what we call a shaitan. Whether they are human, whether they are jinn. As for the jinn, there are Muslim jinn who are obedient to Allah. There are Muslim jinn who are falling a bit short in their obedience. There are non-Muslim jinn who want to accept Islam. There are non-Muslim jinn who are sympathetic towards Islam. There are non-Muslim jinn who never heard of Islam. There are non-Muslim jinn who are opposed to Islam. So the jinn are very much like the humans in that regard. So therefore not every jinn is a shaitan, nor is every shaitan a jinn. From the ugly appearance of the shayateen, this is mentioned in Surah Al-Safat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the ugly appearance of the jinn or of the shaitan from the jinn. And this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it specifically about the shayateen, not about the jinn in general. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the tree of Zakur, and Zakur is the tree that grows out of the base of the hellfire, the tree that grows out of the base of the hellfire. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, إِنَّهَا شَجَرَةٌ تَخْرُجُ فِي أَصْلِ الْجَحِيمِ It is a tree which comes out from the base of the hellfire. طَلْعُهَا كَأَنَّهُ رُؤُوسُ الشَّيْطِينَ Its fruit are like the heads of the shaitan. So this is an evil tree that grows in the hellfire. It's the most disgusting and the most horrible tree and the most horrible food. Allah describes it as تَعَامٌ أَثِيمٌ A horrible, painful food. Now if you imagine Allah describing the tree of Zakum like this, and you imagine the fruit of Zakum being like the head of the shaitan, we know from this that the shaitan has a very ugly appearance. Also from this, we know the shaitan has two horns, as is reported in the hadith of Sahih Muslim from the hadith of Ibn Umar, that the sun rises between the two horns of the shaitan. We know that messengers or prophets were sent to the jinn from themselves. Because Allah says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ الرَّسُولَ أَنِ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ We have sent to every nation a messenger saying, worship Allah and avoid the false gods. So from this we know that the jinn, uh, that, uh, the jinn were sent prophets and messengers. However, we also know that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the last prophet to the men and the last prophet to the jinn. So he was sent to both the jinn and the humans. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Say, O Muhammad, it has been revealed to me that a group of jinn listened and said, Indeed, we have heard Quran and Ajara, an amazing Quran. It guides to the right course and we have believed in it and we will never associate anyone with our Lord. The Prophet Sallallahu gave da'wah, he called the jinn to come to Islam. He was the prophet of the jinn just like he was the prophet of mankind. So the jinn, he gave them da'wah, he called them to Islam, he invited them to accept his message. After him, no prophet came from man and no prophet came from the jinn. 
But prior to him, there were prophets from the jinn, just like there were prophets from mankind. The jinn, they have their own world, their own scholars, their own living places, their own food, their own drink. And in terms of the relation to this world, they often have inhabit what we think of as unclean or deserted and uninhabited places. The jinn live among us and there are some animals that see them. Well, of course, under normal circumstances, we can't see the jinn. But in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim from the hadith of Abu Hurairah, the Prophet وسلم, said, if you hear the crowing of the rooster, then ask Allah for his bounty, for it has seen an angel. And if you hear the braying of the donkey, then seek refuge with Allah from the shaytan, for it has seen a devil. And in the hadith of Abu Dawood from Jabir ibn Abdullah anhuma, that the Prophet وسلم, said, if you hear the barking of a dog or the braying of a donkey, then seek refuge with Allah, for they see what you do not see. So this is an evidence that there are some animals that see the jinn in their natural form that we don't see. And that gives us some etiquette in terms of how we deal with that. The jinn, including the shayateen, eat and drink. In Sahih al-Bukhari from the hadith of Abu Hurairah the Prophet وسلم, commanded him to bring some stones to use to clean himself after using the toilet. The Prophet وسلم, said to him, do not bring me bones or dung. Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him, he asked why. The Prophet وسلم, said, they are the food of the jinn. A delegation of the jinn of Lusaybin came to me and what good jinn they are. And they asked me for provision. I prayed to Allah for them and asked that they should not pass by any bone or any dung, but they would find food on it. Likewise, in Jami' Tirmidhi from Abdullah bin Mas'ud, the Prophet ﷺ said, Do not use dung or bones to clean yourselves, for they are the provision of your brothers from among the jinn. Likewise, in Sahih Muslim, from the same narration of Ibn Mas'ud, the Prophet ﷺ said, A caller from among the jinn came to me and I went with, with him and recited Quran to them. Ibn Mas'ud said, He took us and showed us their footsteps and the traces of their fires. They asked him for provision and he said, You will have every bone over which the name of Allah has been mentioned. When it falls into your hands, it will have plenty of meat on it. And all of the droppings are food for your animals. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Do not use bones and dung to clean yourselves after relieving yourselves, for they are your food, the food of your brothers from the jinn. This tells us about the food that is used by the Muslim jinn. Note this, all of this slide is talking about the food that is used by the Muslim jinn. So it's saying that when we discard bones that we've mentioned the name of Allah upon and we throw those bones away, the jinn eat the what is remaining of those bones or the jinn eat some, take some kind of sustenance from those bones. Whenever there are animal droppings, the, jinn, the animals of the jinn feed from those animal droppings. As for the shaitan, the shaitan, he feeds from something else. In Sahih Muslim, from the hadith of Ibn Umar, the Prophet ﷺ said, when one of you eats, let him eat with his right hand, and when he drinks, let him drink with his right hand. For indeed, the shaitan eats with his left hand and drinks with his left hand. And this is further explained in the hadith of Sahih Muslim that the Prophet ﷺ said, when a man enters his house and mentions the name of Allah, Bismillah, when entering into the house, and when eating, the shaitan says there is no place for you to stay and no dinner. When he enters the house and does not mention the name of Allah upon entering, the shaitan says you have a place to stay. And if he does not mention the name of Allah when eating, the shaitan says you have a place to stay and you have dinner. So as for the believing jinn, they eat from the bones and their animals eat from the dung that is left by, by animals, animal droppings. As for the shayateen, the devils, they eat from us. When we eat with our left hands, when we say, when we don't say Bismillah when we eat, the shaitan eats from what we eat from. The shaitan shares in our food. So this is something to bear in mind. The jinn marry and the jinn multiply. The evidence for this is in Surah Al-Kahf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa hum lakum adu. Allah says, then will you take him, i.e. Iblis, 
and his descendants as allies other than me. The key we want here is the word Dhuriya. Dhuriya means that Iblis, as a jinn, has had offspring, has had children. So we know that Iblis, when he was put onto this earth, Iblis has had many children. Likewise, we have an evidence for this in Surah Al Rahman. Allah says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In paradise, there are these uh, castles or palaces. In these palaces, there are women who are qasiratul qarf. They don't look at anyone other than their husband. Qasiratul qarf means they lower their gaze. They don't raise their eyes to anyone other than their husband. And then Allah says, لَمْ يَطُمِتْهُنَّ إِنْ No human being, nor has any jinn had relations with them. Now this word, at uh, this word here, it tells us that the jinn, they have, uh, they, they multiply like we do. In other words, the jinn are capable of having uh, intimate relations and the jinn have children from that. So these two ayat prove to us that the jinn reproduce similar to the human beings and that the jinn have children. Qatada said the children of the shaitan produce offspring just like the children of Adam produce offspring but they are greater in number. And as for them falling in love with human beings, we'll talk about that later on.